Managing Violence Podcast, episode 74 with Willie the Bam Johnson from selling crack to the Martial Arts Hall of Fame. It's a hell of a story. Buckle up. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Managing Violence Podcast, episode number 74. Today, I am joined by martial arts legend, Willie the Bam Johnson. Now, for some of you, he may have flown a bit under the radar. He's a Black Belt Magazine Hall of Famer. He's been on the cover of Black Belt Magazine, a number of karate magazines. He holds a seventh degree Black Belt in karate, a fifth degree Black Belt in Wushu Kung Fu. But there's more to Willie than just the martial arts. His story is is unique. It's it's powerful. From growing up poor in Baltimore, uh, getting into selling drugs as a, as a teenager, uh, being surrounded by death and violence and, and addiction, uh, most of his early life um, and then going down a path that ended up with him despite being a champion, despite winning tournaments, uh, ending up selling drugs and, and making a business on the street. He uh, would end up in maximum security prison before eventually turning his life around through martial arts. That's the cliff notes. There is so much detail. There's so much emotion. There, there's a raw, uh, man, there, there's just something about Willie. He's a, he's a great human being and uh, I had so much fun talking to him. Uh, it, it impacted me emotionally, and uh, you'll, you'll see as we as we get through, especially if you're watching this video, there's a bit of emotion in this this interview. So uh, I highly recommend you do check out the video on YouTube if you if you are listening to this on, on the audio. Uh, but not only is it about the human interest side, but there's also some really great insight from a self defense point of view or self protection point of view uh, about the mindset of young criminals and and gang violence and uh, you know wh- wh- how these kids end up in this environment and the choices that are, that are made and and, and what informs those those choices. And uh, I think sometimes in the, in the self-protection community, we're too, too quick to other criminals, you know, to other gangsters, to other, uh, um, you know, troubled youths. And, and I think there's so much value in understanding the why and understanding the circumstances and understanding the reality that these kids are living in uh, that can help us with trying to prepare people to, to, to be safe and not to end up in, in the crossfire as such um, in, in the senseless violence that unfortunately is too prevalent, especially uh, in, in areas such as Baltimore. But uh, before I get into the interview with Willie, I just want to remind you, as I said last week, my book, Neon Jungle, A Bounce's True Tales of Lessons, Laughs and Lacerations is now available on Amazon. Make sure you check that out. Uh, And if you'd like to get bonus content from this and every other episode since season four, so that's now, I don't know, 35 episodes, 45 episodes, 45 episodes, 45 episodes of bonus content is now available at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash managing violence. I'll also throw in there something else we've just signed up for, we've just added, is buymeacoffee.com. If you haven't heard of Buy Me A Coffee, similar to Patreon, except no ongoing contributions. So it's just a way to tip the creators that you get value from. If you're a listener of this show and you get value from what, what I'm delivering week in, week out, uh, you don't want to sign up to a, to a regular Patreon, but you would just like to buy me a coffee, head on over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash MVP. All the links will be available in the show notes. And last but not least, make sure you join our Facebook group, The Managing Violence Tribe. It's a fantastic little community of like-minded professionals and enthusiasts. Uh, No politics, no ego, very little bullshit. I won't say no bullshit, but very little bullshit. Uh, It's a a really cool little group. uh, And uh, I hope you you enjoy your time there as well. All right. If you're listening on the the, uh, podcast, head on over to our YouTube channel. Hit subscribe over there. Uh, If you're listening on YouTube then and you haven't subscribed, then why, why not? Go on, hit the hit that subscribe button. Do it. All right, I'm not gonna wait. All right, here we go. Willie the Bam Johnson. All right, welcome to the Managing Violence Podcast. I am here today with Willie the Bam Johnson joining us from Maryland. Willie, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me, sir. And before we get started, I need to give a shout out to Vaughn Jackson. Vaughn might be your biggest fan in the world. Vaughn has been uh, asking me to get you on the show for quite a while. And uh, I'm glad the timing kind of worked out and we managed to make it happen. So Vaughn, this one's for you, my friend. Uh, he's a contributor to the show. He's, he's forever um, suggesting guests to me, but you've been uh, front, of, front of mind for a while. So, so uh, I want to thank Vaughn for, for bringing you to my attention. Yeah, I mean, it's funny how social media works. You know, we, we, we connect through the social world and you don't realize that you're making an impact on people's lives and they're making an impact on you. So just them reaching out to me and talking like, nah, has he called you? 
Did, did y'all set up a pool? <laughs> yeah, you know what I said. No, first of all, I, I missed the first couple of like um, emails you were, uh, um, responses you had sent me because I'm not really like tech savvy. I'm getting good at it, man. My kids are helping me out with it, but you know. But I'm I'm thankful that we didn't finally hooked up, and I'm I'm thankful that I believe God makes everything happen. It's not a religious statement; it's just a true statement. I think this is all about why God allowed me to save my life well over 33 years, you know? Um, and I mean, it, it's just interesting. So, so I, I've done a, a fair bit of reading on you and uh, you've, you've got a hell of a story, my friend. And uh, I, I'd really like to be able to provide a platform for you to tell the listeners about it. So, so let's start at the beginning, right? So you, you, you grew up growing up in a kind of low socioeconomic environment. Uh, t- take us from there. Tell us the story, man. Well, you know, I grew up in the city of Baltimore. I mean, I was born. Um, it's funny. I, I, I tell the story in my in my book that's coming out where how it, my mom had to carry me a, a a couple of months extra, and she almost died. Um, so my 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 fam- my grandparents had to you know nurse her back together. Had to do whatever they do those old country remedies to make sure I stay alive. So, you know, the the, the coming into the world was already a struggle. You know, my mom was handicapped. You know, she couldn't barely hear in two, both ears. And during that time when she was coming up, she, you know, back then, especially in, in African-American community, they were a bit old fashioned. So if you was handicapped, they hid you from the world. They didn't want the world to know what you, you know, what you were fighting through. It was kind of an embarrassment. And as a kid, I never understood that. You know, I, I you know, coming, coming up as a teeny little baby, I remember times just saying, you know, my mom just treated like she was nothing. You know, and as a, as a kid, just trying to like fight for the attention, um, you know, at, at a very young age, that attention allowed me, I'm not going to say that it allowed me, but it, it put me in situations where I was molested as a little kid, you know, and nobody, I couldn't really tell that to my parents, you know, it was because when I, I don't know, I, I always had this thing, at, at, even as a baby, you know, a, a young kid, three, four, five years old, where whatever pain I was feeling, I wouldn't tell my parents about it. Because I already seen the pain they were dealing with in the inner city, you know, welfare, violence. I mean, you name it. You know, they were they were dealing with so much, but they were doing their very best just to make sure they can put food on the table. So when I was going through these painful experiences from other family members, I just would hide. You know, I just wouldn't tell nobody. I would just like suck it up. I learned how to suck it up, and um, even during times from that, you would see uh, it's crazy. Even though the you know back then the the, the community was really, I'm not going to say it was as violent as it is right now because it was good, but there was a lot of things going on behind closed doors that the people didn't see and people didn't know about. And I remember times, man, where neighbors would come and knock on the door and I'm a little kid and all of a sudden I see somebody come and grab my mom and my sister and they begin to fight. And I mean, you see blood, you see all these crazy things going on, but that's what it was like growing up in the city, you know? And as a kid, I feared it so much. I, once again, I would hide under the bed. That was my place to go. Um, my dad, you know, he was one of those guys who he wouldn't take nothing from no one. I believe a lot of this, my anger, when I get angry, I be I, I take upon the personality of my dad because he didn't do some things that he, you know, as a kid, he always told me, you know, you don't ever want to follow this path that I went, that I went down. I mean, I can't tell his story, but he didn't been through some places that I, I mean, I didn't been to some places, but I don't want to go to the places that he went through. So do that, you know, just through that little childhood, I think the one thing that really helped me and gave me a sense of hope was my parents one day let me go to a movie to see Bruce Lee, Chinese Connection. Oh, man, you know, it's like, they know, I mean, you, you, I look at it as a blessing from God because they would never, they were so, even though all that stuff was going on, and once again, I want people to understand, in, in this city, even though there might be a lot of violence going on, when I was coming, there was still a lot of respect. There was still a lot of, you know, morals and principles. Um, so a lot of the stuff that happened, it 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 wasn't the parents that our parents didn't know about it. I mean, they I, I know my dad liked to drink and do whatever, but he had to drink to go through the val- go through all the stuff that he's going through. So when they when that went through through that moment, I guess maybe it was their moment to take a break for me. They let me go to the movie theater. I seen Shawnee's Connection, Bruce Lee, man. It changed my life. When I looked on that movie screen, what did I see? I didn't see a, a Chinese man. I seen me. I swear to you, even as I talk about this right now, I seen me. I seen me being a superhero that can go back 
and finally stand up and fight for all the things that was like beat me down and was hurt me. And, you know, it, it's funny, a, a couple of years later, you realize that that movie was all about Bruce Lee trying to overcome adversity. He was trying to stand up and, 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 and show pride for his people and, 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 and fight back for, un, you know, injustice and all those things. And it, it just, it inspired me. I mean, from that day forth, I was never the same. I began to make martial art weapons. I began to teach myself martial arts. I began to steal books, steal magazines. I mean, I was a little kid. I was calling to Hong Kong, begging and pleading. And Hong- I mean, I know it's so crazy, but my mother, we like, wait, what, what is this phone bill? You, what are you doing calling in Hong Kong and Japan? And <laughs> Hey, I, I wanted it so bad. I mean, it was the only thing that gave me a relief from the misery that I was feeling inside. It was my escape. You know, so I, I, you know, back then you could travel to the city of Baltimore. Um, and I mean, they didn't have that many martial arts schools because, you know, people really, really didn't know the benefits of it. But the magazines gave me a hope to, to, to figure out that there was a school down the street. So I would just go and sit, you know, as I was, I mean, we talking a little teeny kid. I would just sit there inside the dojo and I would, I could comprehend what they were doing in my head. And then I could go home and I can practice it. So I, I, I can remember things just like that. You know, and it just began to like earn me a reputation where people was like, man, who's this little kid? Who's this guy just coming in and learning the martial arts? Because I would learn it, then I would go home and practice, and then I would come back the next day and show the teacher what I had did his whole form. He couldn't believe it. Like, how in the hell is this kid picking this up? You know, so that that allowed me to develop an incredible love for the martial arts. I began to you know, build my own little home dojo in my house. I mean, every type of weapon that you can imagine I had. And, um, but I, I also wanted a little bit more. It was something about, because during that time, Baltimore wasn't like it is. When you hear the story of Baltimore right now, everybody think of gun battles, they think of uh, violence. Baltimore was not like that. It was, it was a good neighborhood. At one time, people might not believe it. Even, and every, everybody had dysfunction in their, in their lives. You know, so even during that time, it was dysfunctional. We still could have a block party. We still could hang out in the playground and play basketball and nobody gets shot. Or, you know, nobody, you know, it was a good time. You know, we never disrespect the adults. You know, if it was an older person to see you cut in class or not going to school, you didn't disrespect them. You, you probably mumbled it under your, under your, you know, right? Like you probably have done, we probably mumbled under our tongue, but we didn't say it verbally, you know, loud enough, you know, <laughs> And it's fun. how old are you? I'm 34. 34. Okay, so maybe you can remember those times where you you know we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have none of that. We just had regular phones. So if a, if a neighbor said, "Boy, if you don't get home right now, I'm going to tell your mother," and then you probably said, "Yeah, all right, man, shut up." And you got three blocks to walk. Now you trying to figure out how in the world did my mom get the message that I said <laughs> something bad to this woman? And they have those cell phones. By the time you get the hit in the house, you get hit upside the head. She's like, a, you better shut up next time. She told me you talk. How, how did that even happen? But I think the community was so caring and so connected that everybody was looking out for each other. And and that helped me. I mean, I mean, I would I, I was I wouldn't say I was a, a, a during that time, I, I got in a little trouble. I would steal little things and do little things, but I also learned how to hustle and take little newspapers. I learned how to be an entrepreneur at a young age, <laughs> you know? So those little things allowed me to be able to um, get real creative and get little monies. And I, I didn't always steal Black Belt Magazine or that, I was on, that I've been on the cover of. That's funny, man. I, I'm on the cover of a magazine I used to steal as a kid. <laughs> or karate, or karate Illustrated, the same thing, you know? So um, as I began to, you know, buy the magazines, make my own uniform, do all these things. The one thing about, I think that helped me, doing those, in those magazines, they would have places that you can go to to compete. And you would find out about, well, Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee, and they would go into these tournaments and they would become famous. So what did I do? I said, man, maybe I need to follow their path. So I tell everybody this story. I found a way to come up with my own sponsorship letters. And I sent them out to sponsors before I was even 16 to ask for enough money to get on a, 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 a bus for like three days. I didn't care about how long it took. I just wanted to get out of the inner city. I wanted to get out the projects. And my first time traveling, 
I went to Madison Square Garden All American Championships and I won first place. I won first place in Madison Square Garden, doing my own made up form and paying my way to you know to get on the bus. And that was the beginning of it all because whatever whatever I was doing creatively, it connected me to a whole world of other people and other great martial artists that came in and began to help me. I mean, I had other people along the way that did help me, but I think you know. Uh, 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 a lot of that was, if I wasn't self-motivated and if I didn't have the passion, I probably would have never gotten to where I, where I have gotten to because one of the things that people don't realize in the inner city, and I talk about it a lot, that little kid that you're trying to tell, stay on the right path and do what you say, do not unless you're going to be with that little kid 24-7 every day, you need to keep quiet and try to understand that kid's life because when that kid's not around you and got to go home and go to sleep, you don't know about his parents being strung out off a of crack. Mm -hmm. You don't know about the neighborhood that that little kid got. When I, at one time, when I tell you the city was a beautiful place, through that journey, I started returning home, and now it was a warfare. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. were dying. You seen you seen drug addicts. I'm talking thousands and thousands of drug addicts lined up and down the street. You seen guys walking around with Uzis. I mean, and, and I'm not promoting this, but my first gun that I ever had was I found on the street when me and my guys was playing after a shootout. That's what our community had came, became. Guys would drive down in, in, in white buses, jump out, run through the playground, and shoot me, shooting at each other. And you as a kid, you you I'm like, man, what is going on? We're on a playground playing. The, the community had changed because now it was all about the money. It was a yeah. drug war. I mean, does, does that, I mean, yeah, let's just, let's just pause there because I know um, I, I read an interview with you in the, the last couple of days where you talked about coming back after winning that first tournament uh, and, and basically having to make a choice about whether you continue to pursue martial arts or whether you basically start running drugs. So to, talk us through what, what was it like after that first tournament and, and, and that decision you had to make? Yeah, that was, that was like one of the tournaments down the road. It was a big tournament. And I came home, it was one of the, the biggest, the US Open. And I, I remember coming home, you know, I come home and, you know, I want to celebrate with my dad. My dad said, yeah, let's go to, I'm gonna go to the bar, get something to drink. So on his way going to the bar, I said, no, nah, I don't want to go, I'm gonna go work out. So on the, on the process of going, going to work out, I went to visit my best friend. And when I walked up the stairs, he was putting a needle in his arm. Mm. I mean, now things that totally changed. I mean, that right there shocked me. I didn't even talk about that in that other interview. When I walked up to celebrate with my best friend, he was now had a had something wrapped around his arm, get ready to put a needle in his arm. I ran out. I went, I went across to the community center to begin to practice. I couldn't believe what the hell was going on. And within a short period of time, all I heard was gunshots rang up. And when I run out to see what it was, it was my best friend being shot up, laying down in front of the building. And I mean, at that moment, and even though he did what he did. See, during that time, we weren't in gangs. I, 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 didn't, I never was in a gang. We were just a crew of guys who loved one another, supported one another. We call us maybe a clique, just friends. That's what we were. We, we grew up together. So, but this guy was my best friend. So when I'm sitting there seeing him laying on that, on that ground, I want revenge. Yeah. All I can think about, who did this? So now my other friends that I grew up with, they're like, yo, you know what happened, man. He was doing the wrong thing, so he got to get dealt with. I'm like, what's going on? It's like everybody now, all these kids, and that's what people don't understand about the inner city. All these kids that just want to be good kids were now faced with a choice that you got to prove that you're a man at a young age or you get eaten alive. That's a world that people don't understand. You don't want to sell drugs, but if you don't find a way to stand up and represent and, and, and let them know that you got some heart and you don't learn that in school, ain't nobody going to teach you that. You got to figure that out on your own. That's based upon a smell, a rhythm. Like you got to bring forth that animalistic instinct, and you can't let nobody let you know, let even think that you don't know what you're doing or, or you lack confidence. So when you talk about confidence in the martial arts, that ain't come from martial arts. That came from them streets. Mm -hmm. So when 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 my when my when they's like, yo, man, what you gonna do, man? We miss you because my personality is always an outgoing personality. You know, if somebody say do this. I'm going to always do it. And it wasn't because I was the toughest guy. I always laugh and tell my students, 
I was just the guy that knew if I do it first and do it good enough, I ain't got to do it no more. <laughs> so I'm the guy that always did the first good enough where I got a good enough reputation where I ain't have to do it no more. <laughs> so they were like, man, we miss you. You going to these karate tournaments? So I was faced with a moment where they said, come to work tomorrow if you want to work with us. And they gave me a gun and a couple of thousand dollars. And I didn't know what I was doing. I went, I, honestly, I went back to my dad and I asked my dad, what should I do? In my heart and soul, I was hoping that my dad said, no, son, stay with martial arts. Oh, man. My dad said, go get paid. Wow. Wow. And um, I don't blame my dad for saying that. Maybe he didn't understand what was happening because nobody else in my family ever sold drugs or used drugs. But when I say I entered an a, a organization that was so powerful and so feared, and we were the youngest kids in our community, the only thing I could do was stay high every day. Mm. I couldn't live with that person I had to become. I had to become an animal. Mm. You know, I, I, I couldn't fear nobody. If you say something, I had to run you into the wall. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you a, a second chance. It was about morals and principles, and that's what we did have, because even though you talk, think about any any like like mafia or, and i'm not calling us that but if you think of any illegal uh, organization you still gotta have a set of codes and principles mm -hmm. and the moment you go against those codes and principles then they go they go and deal with you and we were the youngest kids so i i mean oh man you talk about my life just changed like that i mean we had contracts on us i mean you talk about what but it didn't matter it didn't matter because i was surrounded by a group of guys that would that were that we call it ride or die. They would ride or die with me, while I would ride or die with them. And I'm talking in, in one of my books, I tell people, I say, no. If you're talking about being able to deal with, I'm talking about like overwhelming you and security. So you can imagine being at a, a at a concert and you got millions and millions of people coming. And they come into one entrance and you gotta like make sure you collect the tickets and I mean, that's like chaotic if you're not calm. Am I correct? Absolutely. Well, imagine in a project building having thousands and thousands of people from 9 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night coming and buying, buying illegal drugs from you every minute. And we're talking about well over twenty to maybe $30,000 a day. Yeah, wow. That's how my life changed. Mm. You know? Um, and I mean... I always talk about that, you know, I had to be like my dad. I mean, I was always this guy because, I don't know, I was blessed. I was lucky. I didn't. I, I mean, I, I documented when I got in trouble how many times I got locked up, how many times I was in the drug war, how many times I almost died because I needed to understand the insanity that I was living in. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, you know, what people don't realize, when you're in a world like that, the police didn't come when a shootout was happening. I'm not saying anything bad about the police, but what I'm saying, I've realized that, hold up, ain't nobody coming to stop this while it's happening. They're allowing you to do this, and then when it's over, they'll come. Yep. People, I don't think people understand that. So we, I had to learn, not just was I worrying about the police, I had to worry about my best friends trying to stick me up. Yeah. You had to worry about the haters who were trying to get into your operation to figure out what was going on and snitch on you. There's so many things that you gotta that you gotta be conscious of, but yet at the same time you gotta walk with like a warrior, with with no no fear, no doubt, none whatsoever. And thank God that I'm able to be here today and make it through that through that path. I, I never I never took nobody's life. I never did anything. I mean. I did a lot of things and I've seen a lot of things, but most importantly, I did it to me because that's not the person I wanted to be. That I wanted to be. Yeah. So, so let's, uh, let's talk about how you turned your life around. Like what, what was the turning point for you to get out of that life and to, and to start down the path that, that led you to where you are now? Well, I think the, the biggest thing is that my mom during that moment that I was, you know, we were doing what we were doing. We were like on top of the world. And um, I don't know, I was still going to tournaments. And uh, we, I remember having this meeting downtown Baltimore. It was a big office building. It was some major stuff happening 
Because a lot of the guys that I was with, some of them ended up going to life plus. They ended up going to jail and getting life plus fifty. Wow. One guy ended up. They ended up finding him. My uh, the other guy that you know. He w- He was. He taught me a lot, and I know how strong he is. But they found him hung in a jail, you know. And they thought they said he committed suicide. Uh, that's another story in itself. But I remember all us having a meeting downtown, and he and they were like, "Bam, look." We, we got too much stuff going on right now, man. And, and you got to make a choice. Either you're going to do your martial arts or you're going to come out here 100% and leave that martial arts alone. I don't know. I mean, I think about this today. They could have took me out because once you win, you can't leave. And out of nowhere, I said, no, nah, man, I'm doing my martial arts. And the room just went quiet. And you know what's so crazy? All of them begin to support me in doing my dream. Wow. Because all those guys, what people don't realize, some of them guys were great baseball players. They were great basketball players. They just didn't have a support system at home that supported them in their dream. I didn't have that either as much, but I had enough desire inside myself to say, man, this is what I want. So the moment I made that commitment, I started going back to my martial arts. My mom was now struck with cancer. And, you know, all, sorry. all that time from my mom being sick when she gave birth to me, my mom used to go back and forth to the hospital almost like every year she get operated on. I mean, she was in a hospital so much. I mean, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I can't even believe that she was able to survive as long as she, she did. And, Something happened at, at one time to take the story back where, you know, this, this is the other side. And I'm not putting anything down, but I don't think people understand. Drugs can be stopped in the inner city, but it makes too much money. <laughs> drugs, count, drugs and violence count for a big percentage of the money that we have in, that, in every country. When we talk about, you know, like, uh, uh, what is it, loss and and, and, and debt, well, half of that debt comes from illegal activities. This stuff can be stopped if they want to. Don't nobody own no planes and no ships in the inner city. <laughs> Ain't no way we going to get that stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's like you, you realize that, okay, all right, I want to stop this. I want to turn my life around. And what had happened now, the projects had became so violent that you had to have ID to get in your house. So imagine living in a jail that you can come in. That's how our building had became. So as I'm trying to keep my life in order, do the right things, I remember on 4th of July, I was upstairs playing with my, you know, playing with some fireworks like anybody do, celebrating. And the police at that time, they would get bonuses for locking up people. Like, you know, it was $500 bonus for how many, how many arrests you could have that night. People don't understand this. And people might say, oh, man, that ain't. yes, it is true. Do research back then. So now the police was walking these beats, but they weren't locking up the drug dealers. They were locking up innocent people. <laughs> they, I knew who the guys were that were selling drugs, but they weren't touching them. They were messing with us. And because I was on the other side, I knew why they weren't messing with them. I knew why they were messing with us. So I'm in this, I'm playing, you know, doing this with my mom. And the police comes up and they say, give me the fireworks. And I'm like, we just plan. It's my mom, it's my niece, you know, um, my whole family. And they just, you know, they just started getting real rude. And I think somehow my mom said, leave them alone. So they pushed my mom down and created internal bleeding. My mom was, she was unconscious. And then they hit my niece. Wow. And... I begin to fight them. I begin to defend my mother and defend what was going on. And all of a sudden in the projects, a big riot started. Everybody's running out. And my mom screamed, she, my, no, my niece screamed. She said, Bam, Bam, Uncle Bam, Bam, stop. They gonna kill you, they gonna kill you. So I stopped. They handcuffed me. I wasn't doing nothing, but I understand it's probably the common from what I did before. I accept that, but what they did to my mom and what they did to my sister, my niece and them, there was no need. They weren't selling. They don't know anything about the drugs. They just wanted to have a good time. Yeah. So they took me. Imagine being in a high-rise building, well up like we're talking 12 stories. I mean, you can imagine how many steps you got to go down. 
So because they couldn't go in the elevator, because now a riot was happening. People was running out, leave Bam Bam alone. He's karate, he's doing this for the community. So they took and ran, tried to run me down the stairs. And I would take my shoulder and hit the wall because they were trying to smash my face in the wall. And I was hitting the wall and hitting the wall and hitting the wall. And then finally when they got me downstairs, I mean, the handcuffs were so tight. I mean, it was had to be the whole project was out. Let him go. He's not doing anything. Leave him alone. And so the police put me in the paddy wagon. And, you know, I, I, he said, well, you know, if you plead innocent, we'll, we, we won't give you a big charge. We'll give you a low charge. And another officer came in and said, let him go. Take them handcuffs off. What are y'all doing? Long story short, that right there made me have an anger for authority that I never thought I would ever have. Because I still believe at this point, and it's the first time I ever said, I believe because of that, it created internal bleeding that led to cancer spreading in my mom's body. Mm. We just was too poor. Mm. Nobody cared a fuck. Sorry, man. It's okay. Nobody fucking cared. Even the karate world, nobody fucking cared. None of them didn't care. Yeah, they say they cared on the surface, but wasn't nobody trying to come there to help when we was going through those, those, those day-to-day struggles. So that they, they locked, my, my mom is, is now got cancer. You know, they, 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 the judge locked me up for one day to use me as an example. Hmm. I go on with my portfolio. I go on with everything to show this judge that I'm doing the right thing. He said, no, y'all down in them projects think y'all can do whatever y'all want to do. We're going to give you one day over city jail. I've never been locked up like that ever in my life. Imagine being locked up and going through a jail, and now the people that are checking you in are your students. Wow. How could you even? How could you even come back from shit like that? And I didn't tell my mom. I didn't tell nobody because I didn't think that they were going to lock me up, <clears throat> even though it was one day what I had to go through to stay alive and make it through that. It was humiliating. I had a karate school. My students were like um, police officers and correctional officers. So I, I got this anger I'm running around with when I'm seeing my mom, my mom dying. So I said, I'm going to go back to the game. F everybody. I'm going to go back and I'm going to get money. Y'all going to do this to me? So, and plus martial arts wasn't paying me money. So while I'm doing all of this, I didn't believe that my mom was dying. But my mom was dying. And it's like, it's chaotic when I talk about it. All these things happen. I'm selling drugs. I'm, I'm still doing tournaments. But I never would go, I would never take drugs. I would never go high or anything because, but I had to sell drugs to make life better for my mother. I had to make things better for her. I seen what was going on. So this one time I was now hit with an opportunity to go to New York City and be on the front cover of the first karate magazine called Official Karate. I suppose I've been meeting my instructor at the bus station so I can go to New York. My mom's dying. I'm not really getting it because, I mean, you know, my mom, I was like a, ba- a, 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 a mommy's boy. She, she protected me from everything. So I'm not really thinking she's going to die. So I go out to a club. I'm partying all night. And I come back late at night. And I fall asleep. And I miss the bus. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, my, my sister say, Mommy's going. Yeah, my, my, mommy's dying. So I get up. And I go in the room, and my mom, and I, she said, Bam Bam, be good. Bam Bam, be good. And I grab her, and I hold her, and everything in my life was gone. My, they had to pry my mom out of my arms. I wouldn't let it go, because everything I did, people don't understand. Everything I did was for my mother. All the drugs I sold was for my mother. I seen how people treated her in the welfare line. I see how people made her feel like she was less than nothing. And I had to grow up and be a man. And if I had to do it again today, I would do it again today because I had to grow up and make sure. When my mom started being happy because I brought home karate trophies, I was happy. When my mom started celebrating and saying, Bam Bam, where the trophy, Bam Bam, where the trophy? That meant more to me than anything in this world. So the karate schools, the dreams that I have today, that was for my mother, man. That wasn't for me. That wasn't because I wanted to be a drug dealer. That wasn't because I wanted to be in a gang. 
I wanted people to stop abusing and treat my mother like she was a piece of shit. So when my mom died, I wanted to die. So anything that I could put in my body, I put in my body. And I started putting things in my body. I never shot drugs, but anything I could put in so I could die. I was putting in and I wouldn't die. God just kept letting me stay alive. And after so many different moments of, you know, going in and out and in and out and in and out and homelessness and eating out the trash can and giving opportunities, I finally ended up in a max security prison. Locked down for 23 hours and let out for one hour. And because I was claustrophobic when I got locked up, I was ready to hang myself. And at that moment, I mean, once again, I, I, I believe in the power of God. I got locked up and they searched me and made me take off all my clothes, but I still got into jail with drugs and money. They did not find the drugs and money. But I sat there in that cell when I was contemplating suicide and contemplating using those drugs. I said, what are you doing? You know better. What do you, what do you, you can't use the drugs because you're going to go crazy. And I just dropped down on my hands and knees, flushing them drugs in the toilet. And I still have the paper. I wrote in 1989, God, if you would give me another chance to go and be a living example for every kid, so you don't have to go through what I went through. I would never abandon you. And that was 34 years ago. It'll be 30, yep, 34 years. And I began to rehabilitate myself. Didn't nobody rehabilitate me. Didn't nobody like come and see me. Didn't nobody help me. I had to help myself. But the beautiful thing about the backtrack, because my parents did implant, you know, put good things in me. The community put good things in me. My, I even went to China, you know, during those times. I got, I was like one of the first African-Americans to train in mainland China and get certified and be recognized as one of the greatest martial artists to ever train in China. So in that moment, I said, you, something's wrong with you. And I can't, it came to me, something said, stronger than drugs. I got to be stronger than drugs. So I came up with a program name called Stronger Than Drugs. And in the jail when I was trying to figure out who could I talk to, who can I get the help? Remember, I'm always this creative kid. I'm always, you know, trying to figure out a way. And the guy, I went to the, the ward and I said, I got this great idea, sir. You know, I, I just wanted to know if you could help me. It's called Stronger Than Drugs, where I can go back and talk to kids about my story and maybe they won't be like me. He said, that's a great idea, Mr. Johns. Let me go and talk, let you talk to somebody. Well, in the prison, there was this guy, he was a guard. And he never said anything to anybody. He walked around with a, with a Bible, with a Quran. He was just like real big, you know, and he just never said anything to anybody. And he said to me, even when I say to him, you know, you, you got to be hard. You know, you don't want nobody to you saw. But I'm like, man, you, you, you just didn't want to mess with him because he had that ore about him. So he said, well, won't you go and speak to Brother D? I'm like, Brother D, that's the same guy that be sitting there all day with the Bibles and the Qurans and just reading about God. I ain't tell him that, but I'm like, oh, man, I got to build up the courage to go talk to this guy. <laughs> so I go to him, and I, I tell him my idea, and he say, hey, all right, little brother, come to a meeting with me. I say, okay. All right. I'm, I'm you know, still once again inside. you like, man, what is this? So I'm thinking it's going to be a meeting. It was a meeting. It was a three-hour meeting called Who the Fuck Are You? <laughs> okay. That's real, and I'm sorry for getting yeah. it. Am I okay? No, yeah, you, you, you're fine, man. There's, there's, there's no censorship on this show. You, you tell your story, my friend. The, the, well, well, that's the name of the meeting. It was called, Who the Fuck Are You? Any man that's in jail and not taking care of his kids is not a man. Any man that believes that some drug or some something out there on them streets is going to change his mood is not a man. So sit down, shut up. Put the tape on your mouth and listen up. I'm like, who is he talking to? <laughs> and he called me every name in the book. I mean, there's some names he called me, man. I can't believe I sat there and I listened to what he would say. But the difference was he was saying the truth. He said, but he said, only one of y'all gonna make it. It was probably like 25 of us. I'm competitive, so I had to make it. <laughs> And already I was reading the Bible and reading the Quran. I was doing everything that Malcolm X was doing. I was doing, I was reading every book that you can grab your hand on. 
But this man changed my life. It was the first time I was able to cry. And he told me real men cry. He showed me how to become a man. He was the first man in my life ever told me that I had to change everything about me. I had to change the way I talk. I had to change the way I walk. Even sometimes when you come on the street, you know, back then you were talking codes. Bill Zack, Dizak, Wizzero, Wizzero. So nobody couldn't hear what you was talking about. He's like, man, don't be talking about that in here. Or you, at the end of your sentence, you was always say, you know what I mean? He was like, no, nah, I don't know what you mean. Take it and get it out your vocabulary. How are you going to get a job talking like that? But I think the power in this man, he had seen a life of his father being murdered in his eyes that made him come back for a man like me. You, you, you see, it, it, the only way we can help is that that experience got to be real. You can't be talking no, no book knowledge when you're trying to save someone. It, I, I don't know. I, I, it wouldn't work with me. I needed you to be real. So I couldn't bucket what you were saying because you knew firsthand. You told me. It's like, yeah, you, he told me, he said, look, if you want to go back out there for another, another test run, go get high, go get money, whatever, go ahead. I'll give you the first, the first amount of money. And if you make it back, I'll still be here. And you know what? That changed my life. That man gave me the tools that were already in me, but now it was time for me to use it. And that's what changed my life. So what would I do? I, when I was locked up, I didn't, I didn't do nothing that men do to, because they want to be with a woman. I, I restrained myself from anything. If God put me here, then guess what? I don't want nothing like that. When it was time for me to go to the court and the judge asked me, how do I plead? I said, guilty, your honor. I want out. I, I, I want out. Let me out. And I, and I was surrendered. I was ready. I was, I was done. So when I went in that cell, all I pleaded with God was, and I said, can I just get a cell by myself? Well, the first day I went there, there was somebody. After that, nobody else was there. It was just me all by myself. And that right there, that changed me. That allowed me to, to really get to love me, to get to know me, to, to read about me, to study. And I did everything that it took to become a responsible person. I did everything it took. I mean, and that was the change, man. I, I just wanted better. And I had to do whatever I needed to do to rehabilitate my life by connecting with the resources and the people that were there so I could become a better person. And most importantly, I mean, I had kids, so I had to also take responsibility of being a good father. I had to go back and not live. I had to break the cycle. And martial arts, the truth of the matter is, if it wasn't for martial arts, the beautiful thing about martial arts is that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, especially if you teach it from a traditional standpoint where it deals with the, the principles and the traditions of martial arts. So I already knew what I needed to do. Now it was time, like, like right now during COVID, you know what we need to do to make it through every day. Either you can complain or, 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 or blame, or you can suck it up, take responsibility of yourself. And that's what happened. That's what turned my life around. And it was the greatest moment in my life. Man, that, that is, it's, it's a hell of a story to tell you the first part. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, it's, <laughs> you, you're an incredible human being, Bam. Um, I, let, let's. Uh, I mean, we, we are going to run out of time to tell the, the whole the whole blow by blow. But let, let's talk a little bit about what you've done since then. I mean, you you've been you've been in Hollywood. You've been a stuntman. You've been on the cover of magazines. You're you're in Hall of Fames. Um, you you started uh, your your own system. You've, you've created Point MMA. Uh, there, there's so many things that could probably be a show in their own right. But uh, let's talk about what you're doing right now. Like. Who, What's where is this journey taking you over the last say thirty years since that moment? I think if you would say right now, my goal is still the same. Is that point MMA? We call it. We call it now. We have an element where we call kids point MMA thirty seven skills for kids by kids. So it's my kids teaching other kids how to learn martial arts and the fun. Let's not say martial arts, but learn the sport of MMA in their home. So even before COVID, we were trying to do all of this. So it's giving them a chance, like you, you can go by basketball and you can practice all by yourself. And if you get, if you feel like you have passion, and you want to do it more to your parents will take you to a lead. Well, that's what we did with the 37 skills. We wanted it to go away from all the traditional settings so we can go to the consumer. So it's for kids, by kids. And what the goal is, we call it profitable change. You can't change the inner city or any bad place without money. 
So you got to go and show that community how to become self-supported through his own contributions. So when, when you go to those communities, I can see kids come in and I know the kids like might have one, you know, I'm looking at this kid, he got on a hundred dollar pair of Jordans, but his mom says she can't pay for martial art lessons. It ain't, it's not that they can't afford it. It's just they got their priorities mixed up. So what we wanted to do was find a program where we can go back to the inner cities in any community because it's no longer just, I, I hate the term underprivileged or inner city because these problems are right in the suburbs, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do, we want to tap into the kids that feel lost, feel disconnected, feel overwhelmed, especially during COVID-19 and give them a chance to learn a, a, a basic system what they love, which is MMA, the hottest thing around, but the core is the principles and values that turn my life around. And, and giving them firsthand knowledge of the consequences when you like want to rebel against what I'm saying, I'm like, bro, listen, let me tell you what the consequences are. So that's our ultimate goal to, to really get to build coaches and mentors all over the world to come on and be a, be, a, be, a, be a part of what we're doing because martial arts can change the world. But right now, martial arts is not connected to the, the group of people that it was connected to when I got involved. It's, you know, that, it, think about it. Many sports, we don't get the, the, the core athlete, that, that one that got the grit or the grind because it costs so much money where the politics and the money, if you don't have that, you don't get that, you don't get that opportunity. What we are doing with kids, Fort Main 37 skills, everybody get the opportunity. A little kid can come in, he's being trained by a preteen, and then guess what's so awesome? When the preteen gets skilled enough at the age of 15, they can now become an entrepreneur. They can become th their own business person. They can hire themselves out for for like in a, in, in, in like in, in our in our state. You only have to be fourteen to get a summer job. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you? If you give them a skill, they can teach point MMA at the at, at the um summer camps, at the at the health clubs, and all these things. These are things that I think a lot of adults don't don't realize. But I guess it's that that's what my heart is. That's what me and my wife's heart is. We want to. Make sure kids have a have a better choice than what they have right now, and ha make sure that point MMA is a part of. They want to be a UFC champion, they can, but I'm trying to be, develop champions in life where they can be champions in every aspect of life. The competition part is just a small element of that. Man, I love that so much because, uh, like, we we all know that martial arts can change lives. I mean, we're the, 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 the most of our listeners have grown up in martial arts, or they or they train martial arts. I grew up in martial arts. I, I know the the values and everything that that can change lives. Now, I, I didn't have the childhood you had. Uh, you know, compa comparatively, I, mean, I, I was I had a fairly stable life, um, but I know the impact that that martial arts had. Um, and, but I think a lot of instructors know it but they they're not deliberate about it right there, there's not it's like well if you just stick around long enough you kind of absorb this stuff um it's not really like a, a you know we've we've got a we've got a community here that's disadvantaged that that they're selling drugs not because they they want to be criminals they're selling drugs because it's a way to make money and yeah. and there's no other way to make money there's no other way to support you know like to support your mom or or whatever it is as, as your driving force like you said i mean you didn't want to be a drug dealer but that was the viable option right it was and you can come in with high high ideals of like no you shouldn't do that you shouldn't do drugs you shouldn't you shouldn't do crime you shouldn't it's like sure but that's not my reality man like that's that's not how i survive uh, and unless you know that reality then it's hard to sort of as you said, make any sort of change. You've got to be real. You've got to come from the same environment for them to actually listen to you. But I think what, you, what you're doing is so special because it's not just a, a saying, hey, kids need martial arts. It's not kids need martial arts, but they also need an ability to make some money and they need some ability to, to, to see there's another way to do life. And, and, I th and, and someone like yourself who has the story that you have, uh, I mean, I, I, again, I, I don't talk about religion on the podcast much, but, the, but, but regular, regular listeners know I'm a Christian. Uh, and, I, and I firmly believe that God puts stories or put, put situations in our lives for us to be able to use them to benefit others. And, and I think what you've been through and the way you've turned that into something that can, that can truly benefit and save lives. And you said at the front, you, you've never taken a life. I can guarantee you saved a life whether you know it directly or not. And, and I think that's an amazing testimony to you uh, and, and to, uh, uh, so I forgot the guy's name in prison that, that sort of turned you around. I mean, that like, think about how many lives brother he might've changed. Brother D. Brother D, yeah. His name he, is Brother D, yes. I mean, think about how many lives he may have changed um, from behind bars. Uh, and that's, 
that's incredible to think about what legacy he might be leaving behind. Um, Man, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story. It, it's powerful. I, I'd love to, to have you back on in the future to talk about some other aspects of it. Um, but uh, I think that there's so much that we can take away from just what you've shared so far. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, I, I know you do a lot of guest speaking. I know you do a lot of, um, a lot of work with, with community groups and so on. If there's anyone listening who thinks that your story could help their community or, or, or someone they're working with, how do they get in touch with you? They can go to pointmma.com. Um, right now we are, we, we, we call it, we, we're on a quest for COVID-19 to build. Our kids need us more than any time than ever right now. So we're trying to, we're trying to get kids on board, develop coaches, mentors. So if they go to pointmemate.com, they can become a part of what we're doing. I mean, this is not my program. This is our program. We make a difference, not me. You know, and I think that's the beautiful fellowship of like-minded people like you. And I thank you for having me on here, you know. So, yep, pointmemate.com. That's it. Perfect. All right, Willie, I know you're going to stick around and do the bonus questions with us, but for those that are, that are leaving us here, thank you very much, Willie the Bam Johnson. Wow, guys, I told you that was going to be heavy. Uh, there was so much in that. There's so much emotion. There's so much raw human story that we can all benefit from. If you listen to the whole thing and you didn't come away at least a little bit inspired, a little bit moved, then uh, I don't know what to do, man. I, I, I don't know what else I can give you. If that doesn't tick some boxes for you, I don't know what else to give you. But guys, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Please support Willie the Bam's work. Uh, check out pointmma.com if you'd like to engage Willie to, to help with any sort of event you've got going on. Uh, he's got a servant's heart and I know he'll be willing to, to participate in, in just about anything that uh, is mutually beneficial. So, uh, so guys, uh, thank you for that. Thank you to Willie the Bam. Thank you to Vaughn Jackson for bringing Willie to my attention. I hadn't heard of Willie before Vaughn messaged me and, uh, and he pushed pretty hard for, for, for me to get Willie on. And I thought, man, I've got to check into this guy. And uh, I'm so glad I did. So thank you. Thank you very much, Vaughn. And that's why we have the Managing Violence uh, Patreon supporters group who can recommend guests because sometimes, hey, I'm not aware of everybody. Uh, I, I don't follow every single person out there that's doing great stuff. So I always welcome the suggestions. All right. If you're not a member of the Managing Violence Tribe on Facebook, make sure you do that. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube. And if you're listening to the podcast on an audio platform, please go and leave us a review because it helps spread the word about the podcast. All right, that will do us for the week. Go buy my book. Just kidding. Not really. Go buy the book. All right, I am back next week with, speaking of books, the uh, prolific martial arts author, Mr. Lawrence Kane, talking about his most recent book, Shit Sun Tzu Said. Yes, that's the actual name of the book, and it's tremendous. All right, I will see you next week. Until then, talk to you next time. <laughs>